the governor of Hawaii has placed the territory under martial law and has required all persons to obey such proclamations, orders, and regulations as I may issue during the present emergency. Any violation of this duty is treason and will be punished by the severest penalties. Good citizens will cheerfully obey. Walter C. Short, U.S. Army, commanding. My dad was reading me the morning funnies, and all of a sudden there was this huge explosion that sh it rocked the whole house. And I'll never forget the sight of that black smoke, horrible black smoke. When I was uh, in a class of democ democracy, FBI came, the principal came to the class there, man. Say, said, Harry, you come out. I said, yes. So I said, you come to the uh, principal office. The night of December 7th is when I realized that we were at war with Japan because my dad was taken that night. December 7th, which is my, my birthday, that's when the war broke out. And so uh, things were forbidden, activities were forbidden not being able to go out at night. And the mere fact of having barbed wire on the beaches, the amount of people, especially the armed forces, dominating the beach scene, getting into fights with the beach boys. It was, um, it was a traumatic experience, I think, for, for all of us in that time. And I think to cover up all of that is we were very active on the beach and naughty, you know. In a climate of fear, the military's takeover of civilian government in Hawaii seemed almost logical and natural. With the public imagination inflamed by rumors, people lived in dread of a second air raid or an invasion. To prevent a Japanese force from capturing American cash, U.S. currency was stamped with the word Hawaii. If people could flee the islands, they often fled. The military censored the mail and also listened in on private telephone calls. Speaking anything but English on the telephone was banned. Everyone over the age of six was fingerprinted. Everyone was required to carry an identification card, as well as a gas mask. The blacking out of light at night, the blackout, would be most widely remembered. When you worried about the blackout, when you worried about gas, when you worried about whether your kids will get to school, whether or not the gas masks will work for the kids, if you're an ordinary worker, you don't worry about the constitutionality of martial law. What you worry about is how can we get the family through this particular crisis? The American tradition of checks and balances among the executive, legislative, and judicial branches was replaced by a military governor whose powers were not checked. His general orders suspended the right of free assembly, free expression, free movement, and trial by jury. Military officers, untrained in the practice of law, sat as judges, handing out harsh sentences to the individuals who passed through their courts. It meant that people didn't have uh, rights, uh, that these courts were uh, rapid-fire proceedings. Most of them lasted only a few minutes. 99.9% .9 of the people brought into the court were for criminal matters were found to be guilty, and there was no review, there was no appeal. 
the fight over constitutional rights came down to something called habeas corpus. The, the writ of habeas corpus is called the, the great writ because it's the ultimate uh, freedom that we have to go to court and to ask the judge to look into why we're being incarcerated. The, the term means, you know, bring me the body. So the judge issues the writ of habeas corpus, which means that the executive branch officials have to deliver the prisoner to the court and explain why the person is being kept in, in custody. Because of press censorship, many people in Hawaii did not know that more than 400 individuals were arrested immediately after December the 7th and held indefinitely without charges. Through the course of the war, this number grew to 1,500. Most were of Japanese ancestry. Well, the sheriff came and we were all sleeping but I could hear my ma mother crying. And uh, they said that, uh, oh, he'll be back in a few days. They're just going to take him in for questioning. Then a few days later, uh, we're, we were told that we should take some clothes to him. We did get a chance to visit him, and uh, just through a small window, like a cashier's window, and couldn't touch him or anything, and uh, we found out that he was going to be shipped to uh, Sand Island. And then we didn't see him after that until a year and a half later. Despite the fact that there was never a single case charging espionage or sabotage by a person of Japanese ancestry, fear of the large Japanese ancestry community not only helped get martial law going, but kept it going. Then there are two FBI men who are standing. So are you Urata, Harry Urata? Say yes. So you're under arrest. Oh, just a moment. I like to get my things, you know, brush, you know, toothbrush, you know, all those things. Say no, no, no. You just come with us. Boom. Beneath the cloak of anti-Japanese sentiment, the constitutional rights of all people were being violated. That afternoon, there was this car that drove in, into the, the yard. And so I ran upstairs, and I was shocked that these guys were running right up, right behind of me. So I, I, I was just like, what in the world is happening here? Mom said that, oh, she'd have to put on some lipstick. So she went into the bathroom, the guys were right after her, and I saw a pistol. She turned to me and she said, Doris, take care of your little sister. I'll be right back. They didn't know what in the world was going on. They weren't charged with anything. The FBI kept saying, you're aliens. No, mom and dad said, we're American citizens. So she disappeared, and that was it. Historians were to agree that seven months after Pearl Harbor, America's victory at the Battle of Midway Island meant that Japan posed no serious threat of invasion. Hawaii's civilian courts were obviously able to function, and in fact, always had been able to function. Attorney Garner Anthony took a stand against continuing martial law under these circumstances. Garner Anthony played a key role because he was smart and, and very persistent. And of course, many other people were afraid and, and cowed and, and taking on the US military, of course, is always a challenge. More than a year passed before martial law was lightened. Elements of martial law continued throughout the entire war. After the war ended, the United States Supreme Court ruled that Garner Anthony was right. Of course, it would have been better if they'd gotten to it earlier, but at least they get to it and they make a very clear ruling that 
The civilian courts were open for civil cases. The bars were open. The movie theaters were open. This was a functioning society. And it wasn't a situation where martial law was, was required. Supreme Court Justice Franklin Murphy went further. From time immemorial, despots have used real or imagined threats to the public welfare as an excuse for needlessly abrogating human rights. The right to jury trial and the other constitutional rights of an accused individual are too fundamental to be sacrificed merely through a reasonable fear of military assault. Especially deplorable is this use of the iniquitous doctrine of racism to justify the imposition of military trials. Racism has no place whatever in our civilization. We must be on constant guard against an excessive use of any power, military or otherwise, that results in the needless destruction of our rights and our liberties.